know he rescued my soul his blood has covered my sin i believe i believe my shame is taken away my pain is healed in his name i believe i believe i'll raise a banner because my lord has conquered the grave my redeemer lives my redeemer lives my redeemer lives my redeemer lives i know he rescued my soul his blood has covered my sin i believe i believe my shame is taken away my pain is healed in his name i believe i believe I'll raise a banner Cause my Lord has conquered the grave My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives You lift my burden I'll rise with you. I'm dancing on this mountain top to see your kingdom come. My Redeemer lives. 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 Amen. Our Redeemer lives. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Nathan, we'll start us off with announcements and prayer time. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining in with us uh, online. Thank you for being here today. I've got a few announcements for you, and then we'll spend some time in prayer. So uh, first up, coming up soon on June 11th, Saturday, June 11th, um, and there's been a, a, a thing up on the screen as well. Um, Bob Threat's 90th birthday party is coming up. So June 11th at 3.30 p.m. until 6 p.m. right here in our very own uh, basement. Come and you can join with that family in celebrating and showing some honor for Bob Threat and his years of service and uh, being a family man and a teacher in our community and all those kinds of things. Um, so please, Mark that on your calendars. Um, next up, you've been heard, hearing me talk about this, but um, a camp meeting is coming up this summer quickly as well. <coughs> Pardon me. On June 18th, there will be a, a brief work day in the, well, um, starting at 11 o'clock. So we'll be headed over to the campgrounds and working on things like just cleaning up the tabernacle and getting it ready for the camp season, uh, cleaning up some of the cabins where people stay, uh, doing some, some basic planting uh, of just pretty flowers and stuff on the grounds, some of those kind of things. Um, here in-house, uh, Bonnie Brantley and Henoch Hagos are gonna head that up 
for, for me, because I will be gone during that time. And uh, so check in with them. Hennock has a sign-up sheet that you can sign up on um, so that we know who's going to come and be a part. Um, there's plenty of work to go around, so whatever you're able to come, be able to contribute for that, for that morning, for that part of the day, uh, would be more than welcome. So we would love to get over there as a team and, and just help get things ready for the season. And then coming up on July 10th through 17th, you can pick up one of these brochures back there um, that has all the stuff that you need to, to sign up and be ready for a camp meeting, including all the information of who the speakers are going to be and what the schedule is each day so that you can be sure to mark how you want to come and, and be a part. So don't miss out on that. Finally, as far as announcements, I think, go, um, do want to let you know <coughs> that we do have the discipleship guides for this next quarter. They should be available out on the information table. If you're at home and still want one, uh, we do have a few left. Please just uh, send me an email, call me, something like that, and we'll get one over to you. There is both the adult version, which is the red covered one this quarter, and then the, also for um, preteens and teens, there is a youth version that is a green cover. So if you want to be on the same subject matters, it doesn't always line up word for word of every Thing that's being discussed, but if you want to be on the same subject matter with um, with a teen or preteen <coughs> and be able to have conversation with them along the way, that is a great way to do it. Or in our house, we encourage um, that they be following along with that, just to be building their um, Bible study um, skills and some of those kind of things. So those things are all available to you. Okay. Well, I can feel I still have a little bit of a cough hanging on but I'm doing much better this week, and so I'm looking forward to being with you today and, um, <coughs> and letting you know a few of the things uh, that are coming up in the next few weeks here, this coming season. Okay, well, let's take some time just to quiet ourselves and to pray and to enter into the worship this morning as we seek the Lord together. So I'll just be quiet and let you pray and then close us in just a moment. Father, you are so good. Thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for calling us together as your church and making us a way for us to gather together in your name. Lord, as we just seek to worship you, to <laughs> recall and recount the mighty works of your hands, your faithfulness, and and enduring love, your grace and mercy and patience. Lord, truly you, you are holy and worthy of our praise, worthy of our, our highest thoughts. You are, you are king and all authority belongs to you. May it be a delight of our heart to recognize your authority and freely give our wills to you that you would reign, that your will would be done, 
and that we would see <coughs> your, um, your work accomplished. Thank you for making, <laughs> making a place for us in your household, in your kingdom, and calling each one of us to come and to be with you and to serve alongside. Lord, we love you. You are worthy of, of all of our praise, of all of our worship. May you be glorified this morning. May you have freedom to, um, to expose and to examine us and bring to light the truth. Um, not, not so that we would be embarrassed and crushed, but Lord, that we might let go of the dross, the, the junk, the garbage that has collected and allow that to be cleaned out and that we might bolster our faith and hold fast to you. Thank you for the things that you have seen us through. And I, I don't know all the stories of this group, Lord, but you know the victories that you have provided. You know the protections that you have offered, maybe even ones that we don't recognize ourselves. You know the way that you have gone before us in conversations and situations. You know the doors that you are opening for the future, that the choices that we're making today are, are preparing the way for a greater work that you wish to do. Lord, help us not to shy away from you and the adventure that you have us on. Help us not to be fearful of the unknown, but to trust that you, that you know all, that you are holy and that you are good and that you are leading us in the right direction. We can follow you and obey you in all things. Truly, we, we hold to the scripture that teaches us that you who are in us are greater than anything in the world. May we never doubt it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We offer you our praise this morning. May you be glorified. In your name. Amen. Let's worship together. Please stand once again. To you, O oh Lord, I lift my soul. In you, O oh God, place my trust and do not let me be put to shame don't let my enemies triumph over me my hope is you show me your way me in truth and all my days my hope is you and I am O oh Lord filled with your love you are O oh God salvation oh God my life and rescue me my broken spirit shouts my mended heart cries out cause my hope is you show me your way Yeah. 
hope is you. Cause my hope is you. My hope is you. I lift my eyes up unto the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you, maker of heaven, creator of the earth. Oh, how I need you, Lord. You're my only hope. You're my only prayer. So I will wait for you to come and rescue me, to come and give me life, give me life. I lift my eyes up unto the mountains, where does my help come from? comes from you, maker of heaven, creator of the earth. Oh, how I need you, Lord. You're my only hope. You're my only prayer. So I will wait for you. Come and rescue me. Come and give me life. Oh, how I need you, Lord. You're my only hope. You're my only prayer. So I will wait for you to come and rescue me. To come and give me life.
awesome and great is your name. You overcame, and we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word. Of our testimony, everyone overcome. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all of our praise. You overcame. Awesome and power forever. Awesome and great is your name. For you away, Jesus my Savior I met, oh what a tender compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart, shadows dispelling with joy I am telling, he made all the darkness depart, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole My sins were washed away And my night was turned to day Heaven came down and glory filled my soul Born of the Spirit with light from above into God's family divine Justified fully through Calvary's love Oh, what a standing is mine And the transaction so quickly was made When as a sinner I came Took of the offer of grace He did proffer He saved me, oh, praise His dear name Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure After the passing of time I have a future in heaven for sure There in those mansions sublime And it's because of that wonderful day When at the cross I believe Riches eternal and blessings supernal From His precious hand I receive Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen. You may
may be seated. Pastor Nathan. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Let me give you a a little bit about um, what the next couple of weeks look like as far as our study time together, and then then we'll pray before we dive into the morning's message. Um, So, this week, we're going to be... uh, Occasionally in our our series that we've been walking through, sometimes we take a break from the narrative to zero in on a theological point. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a break from the actual narrative of 1 Samuel, and we're going to zero in on this this obvious concern, this problem that we have seen become more and more clear, especially through these last couple of books of Judges and now in 1 Samuel, uh, but this growing problem of sin. And so today we're going to talk about our need for rescue, our need of a rescuer. Then, next week, we'll jump back into 1 Samuel, and we're going to pick up, I've been telling you that God is doing something new. Something about what he's doing with Samuel is leading to something new he's doing with the people. So next week we're going to take a look at that, and God, (coughs) we're going to see that God gives them something that they've been begging for for a while, something that they've been asking for, um, petitioning God about, God is going to listen to them as they've been looking around at the surrounding nations and saying, you know what all the other nations have that we really wish we had? We wish we had some sort of permanent leadership in place. We need a king. So we're going to take a look at what God does there. And the first king, human sense... Of Israel. Then I'm going to be gone for three weeks. So for those three weeks, um, next week if you're here, you can pick up a little piece of paper that will have it available for you. Otherwise, it'll be on our Facebook page. Or if you're following along and you have the discipleship guides, um, it's it's already laid out in there. But I'll go ahead and give give you three weeks of the regular reading schedule and what we would be looking at. So you can at least kind of keep up or follow along. When I come back at the very beginning of July, July 3rd, we will jump back into the Samuel narrative, picking back up with with the calling of David um, and see how he fits into the line. So that's kind of how our study time is going to go. During those three weeks that I'm gone, I announced it last week, but I'll just give you a reminder this week, um, we're going to have three special uh, times together. The first one is going to be a video presentation. We don't try not to do that all the time, but we are going to do a video presentation of Reverend Vody Bauckham and uh, a very timely message for the day and age in which we live. Um, You won't want to miss that. That will be worth uh, checking out. And then on the... um, On the 19th, our own superintendent, Randy Myers, will be with us and sharing from his heart. And then finally on the, I believe it's the 26th, um, our very own youth leader, Jason Duclos, is going to be sharing from his heart and some of the lessons that God has been teaching him over the last several years of, of trial in their family. And of course, those of you who have been around for some time and know some of his story and have been involved in prayer and and support alongside (coughs) you know that that has been a a very important time and that God is still at work in their lives so (coughs) pardon me (coughs) so please uh, join in for those um, special weeks that we're going to have okay I think that's it for those announcements let's settle in together would you pray with me Lord, thank you for these couple of moments that now we get to uh, gather together at your feet and look to your word, your divine truth, and listen to your spirit, your voice, 
as you minister to our hearts. May you, may you through your truth expose sin where sin needs to be exposed. Would you provide right perspective and, and insight and honesty that we might see ourselves in light of who you are and respond to you accordingly. Lead us into repentance where repentance is due. Lead us into joy and exuberance at who you are and your great grace and mercy. Lead us into rest and um, reassurance, security, because of your great power and your great love. And Lord, call us to a place of, of grittiness where we are ready to serve you. Not because it's easy, not because we wake up every day wanting to, but because, but because we have come to love you and trust you and we are convinced that your way is the only way of salvation, not only for ourselves, but for others around us. Lord, fill us with your kind of love for one another that we would not be willing to stand, stand by and let allow anyone to just slip off into the darkness of sin without a loving fight. We love you so much, Lord. Please guide us this morning. Amen. If you want to turn with me, we are going to be in the book of Romans today. So we are diving into theology. We're going to be in the familiar book of Romans. <clears throat> Through this section of scripture, <laughs> One could argue all the way since the back in Genesis, as, as we ease, um, as we get past the garden, we see this this great problem of sin come in, and sin leads. By the time we get to Genesis chapter six, we see that sin has built up in the life and heart of people. That it is described from God's perspective that. Every inclination, every thought of their hearts was only evil all the time. And we see in real time in our human history the natural progression and ends of sin. That it's leading to death and destruction. That it seeks to permeate and in, infuse and take over every aspect of the heart. God steps in in a very severe way and, and does a restart, so to speak. He narrows it down to one, <clears throat> one family group and particularly one individual who has remained faithful. And he closes them in the ark. He saves them from great destruction through the flood and then releases them to start over in the world. And we would think, aha, this is the the fresh start, the second chance that the world needed. This is what all of us naturally kind of have a sense at, at times in our lives. If, if I could just redo that, if I could just start over, if I just had a second chance, then that I've learned so much more. I've had these experiences now. It would be so much better. What do we see in the world's case? Just shortly after that, even with well-intentioned, God-fearing people, we see that sin has not magically disappeared. It is still present within the heart, within the soul. And it rears its ugly head again, and we see the progression of sin start. We track, <laughs> we track this great promise, this hope, 
through a family line. We, we get involved with Abram and his family, and we, we walked with their family line um, <coughs> through, through times of faith, through times of learning to trust God, and times of failure in human weakness and falling back to their sin, and, and that there, there's times of punishment, of consequence. We see God be faithful to his promise, and he builds these people into a great nation, and he rescues them from famine and difficulty, and, and he, he takes them into Egypt and protects them and grows them into a large group of people, into um, a great host now, f- fulfilling a portion of his promise. But the people lose favor with the hard-hearted new pharaoh. They fall into slavery and are oppressed. And, uh, and much, of, um, much of their culture is strained under that. God steps in and sets them free and leads them on this amazing, miraculous journey through the wilderness. I was listening to uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, radio preachers uh, the other day, um, and he was was, um, drawing the connection for us that that you you can't enter into the promised land until you've walked through the wilderness. That God provides time of wilderness for us to get ready for what he's going to do. That's very much the case that we see um, in Israel's story. That God uses the wilderness to be teaching them lessons, to test them in areas. Will they obey and will they follow his instructions? And sometimes they do really well. And sometimes they don't. And sometimes... Uh, just a small one or two might, uh, in their own selfishness and sin, uh, bring about consequences and a great effect on everyone. Well, we seem to that grow. We came to this time we call the Judges, where we see that predominantly in Israel's history, it's, it's characterized as a season when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There wasn't any um, great revival. There wasn't a large group being faithful. But rather, um, (laughs) by and large, they were doing their own thing, making up their own rules, compromising in areas, um, leaning towards and even bringing in the false gods of the pagan cultures around them. a time of historical decline, slipping off, sliding away from the values, the laws, the truth that they had known. And during that time, there, by and large, wasn't a, a set leader. And so occasionally, God would raise up an individual for a while who, who may not <laughs> bring about... Um, a, a, a huge revival of everyone in obedience, but would at least help lead them in a good direction or protect them from some of the circumstances surrounding them, maybe lead them in a battle that was necessary, or help them um, answer some civil questions, and, and part of their role was to serve as a judge. Various different things that God would use these individuals to provide some sort of relief during that time. Through all of it, we see the sin problem still existing, even among God's people, people who had access to the truth, who had the stories to fall back on of who God was and what he had done. Maybe they had even seen some of those things firsthand and had personal experiences of God's incredible work and and ministry and grace and kindness toward them. And yet overall, it was a period that was dark. It was a period 
where they felt stuck and overwhelmed by the things going on in the world around them. It's a period not too unlike our own, in which people would regularly look out at the, the surrounding world, the times, the culture, and go, how did we get here? Why are things like this? Has God abandoned us? What's going on? going on here is we're reenacting the flood, I think. Those of you at home are confused. Anyways, there's a lot of rain going outside. It's loud. Well, we're going to dive in today and, see, and zero in on, on this theological question of what is going on. Um, what, <laughs> what is going on with sin? So the big idea this morning is everyone is a sinner. Everyone is a sinner and we're deserving of death. But God has provided the means of rescue through Jesus Christ. Sin isn't something that only affects the fringe of society. It, it doesn't show any respect to economics. It's not about rich or poor. It's not about who grew up on what side of the tracks and had the most privilege or social benefit or encouragement. It's not about who your mom and dad were. Sin is not a respecter of station or even hopes and dreams. Sin is a handed down infection, a cancer within, that apart from radical, life-changing, divine, surgical work of God, will overtake every individual. It will constantly seek to kill and destroy and to affect the next generation. Well, let's dive into some theology here. We're going to walk through a few different passages, brief ones, but a, a selection through the early part of Romans here. So we're going to start in Romans chapter 3. If you want to jump to Romans chapter 3 with me. We're going to read verses 9 down through 18 here. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Rome, the, the young church in Rome. And he is describing to a primarily Greek or non-Jewish audience... Um, the universality of sin. And he is debunking the cultural notion that, some, that somehow um, God is only for the Jewish people and that somehow they have a free out because they are the children of God. So he's been walking through some of that and now he is coming to a conclusion. Starting in verse 9. What then... Are we better than they, meaning are Jews better than Greek? Not at all, for we all have already char uh, charged, um, sorry, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks all are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. 
Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Stop there. Okay, this is our first selection. Paul is um, referring to, he's speaking to a general view of of human behavior, of human characteristic, uh, the human state, we might say. Um, And what he's doing, if you're looking in your maybe you've got some helps if you've got a study Bible um, or if you look in some commentaries later. This is an area of Scripture that is, um, is not a direct quote. Sometimes in Scripture, and, and you may in, in your um, Bibles, you may see uh, this typed up a little bit differently, um, which is showing kind of a, a quoting sort of idea. Here Paul isn't just quoting from one certain passage back in the Old Testament, but rather he's taking key ideas and portions uh, both from uh, uh, King David as well as from Isaiah the prophet. And he's, he is <laughs> mixing them together to, to have a running idea. He's addressing from the Old Testament this theology of sin, and that sin is infectious, that it takes over, that no one is is free or or gets gets off, gets off away, but rather that sin is universal. Um, Paul often writes in the various epistles of the process or (laughs) that we see that uh, sin comes from Adam and Eve and is transferred to the next generation and that we see this ongoing reality, this ongoing process that sin is wrought with the heart. It's already present in us. We don't have to learn it from scratch. Um, if someone is, is somehow removed, doesn't know anything about God, the law of sin, the reality of sin is still present in their life. If someone grows up in a very privileged setting of knowing lots about God, maybe is born into a priestly household or a kingly household or whatever it might be, the same infection is still there. It's handed down. And so um, Paul speaks to this, this general condition of mankind. That, that everyone is sinful. Sin has infected and effects all of us. If you look back at verse 9 there, how he puts it, <coughs> he asked the question, again, he had spoken to this earlier in the chapter, are we better than they? Not at all. <laughs> um, we are all under sin. We are all under sin. When it talks about under, he's been making a comparison of what does it mean to live under the authority of the law? So he's taking a very Jewish perspective there. He's taking a perspective based on the Old Testament of that God had given the law. We're going to touch on this a little later on in a different chapter. Um, But what does it mean to live under that? Well, the law exposes what sin is. The law gives us a clear standard of what God expects of us, at least in certain areas that are spelled out, that are written out, that are known and communicated. He juxtaposes that or compares that to what does it mean to live under the law, and in that case he's using law as in the the picture of rule, the authority, the influence of sin. He's saying if all of us are in this position, in this state of having the influence of sin on our lives, what does that look like? 
It's something universally known. It's something we all experience. This, <coughs> the internal self-centeredness. The self-will and desiring things to go my way. Where there is knowledge of God, <coughs> where the law has been known, then we are able to clearly see my will versus God's will, and that they don't line up. They're in conflict with one another. So what we learn is that sin is opposed, it is opposite, it is against, it is in war with God and his very nature. So that takes us down to our last note there from verses 11 through 18. Our sinful nature, <coughs> this influence that we were born into, when left to go its own natural way, when not interceded, intervened upon, our sinful nature leads us into rebellion against God. That's what it's seeking. It is naturally opposed to the nature and character of who God is. Now, please notice, um, please notice that I'm talking a lot about the nature of things. If we're not careful, and again, this is going to come up here again in a moment, if we're not careful, we just start talking about rules and what we're supposed to do or not supposed to do. And we start thinking of sin, and sin is just stuff that doesn't meet with God's checkoff list. That somehow God has some arbitrary set of standards that he's handed off to people of, hey, these are the things I expect you to do while I'm not there, or something like that. And that's not what we, <laughs> that's not the understanding I want to hand off to you from Scripture. Sin, again, we're going to address this in a moment, I'm jumping ahead. Sin isn't sin because, because it's a naughty thing to do, merely. Sin is sin because it is opposite or it is opposed to who God is. So let's keep going. Let's jump over to Romans chapter 5, if you would, just for a few verses. Verses 12 through uh, 14 here. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. We pick back up with this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for until the law, for until, I, sorry, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Okay, interesting section here. Again, we have this, this claim, this description, that the original sin of Adam and Eve has been passed down in the form of a corrupted, a sinful nature. So we see that there is a bent within us. There is a positioning away from God. There is a desire to do our own thing now. Sometimes we lose sight of Adam and Eve weren't born with that. We don't know what that feels like. None of us have ever experienced that. But Adam and Eve did not originally have a bent, a will set in its own direction, but rather were created in harmony with God. They wanted to do the things that God desired. They weren't just <coughs> merely neutral agents, undecided, but God actually created them with a clean, a pure nature 
that was in harmony with him. So it was a big deal when they sinned, when they questioned that, when they listened to the half-truths, the lies of the evil one, and questioned the nature of God, his honesty, if God is selfish or not, and chose to sin, they had to overcome their own benefit of a pure nature. It was a big deal. <clears throat> now, each one of us does not have that same benefit. We are, we are born, and there is already a corruption, a distortion to what God had intended us to be. There's already a bent away from him. There is already a, uh, I don't like using the word natural, because it's actually opposing nature, the nature that God designed us to have. But we have a, a brokenness pulling away from God. Verse 13 speaks to that a little more clearly, where it says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. <coughs> this sin, from the time of Adam and Eve, is opposing, it is contradicting who God is the nature of God. So the nature of sin is opposed to the nature of God. And what we see is that the law stands to expose it. Okay, going slow with this, why? The law itself is not is not what it means, um, how do I say this carefully? The law itself is not goodness. The law is a means of sh putting into some practical terms what re right relationship with God looks like. If we weren't living with this broken, fallen nature, what would it look like? Okay. The nature of sin is warring against that and is saying, no, 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 let's redefine freedom. Freedom means do whatever you want to do. Have you ever noticed that in the real world, absolute freedom is a very dangerous, impractical thing? It's not particularly healthy. <laughs> Right? Driving gets a lot scarier if we say that what we really need is total freedom and ambiguity to just do whatever we want. Right? I mean, that's just a, an obvious, silly, simple example. But we see that when, when we truly have total freedom, there's danger involved with it. What we need in our lives is not some absolute personal freedom to do whatever I feel like. What I need is freedom from what is evil and corruptive and dangerous and enlightenment or awareness, a pull towards what is good and healthy and safe and protect, right? I, what we need is the difference between what is good and what is evil. To see that clearly, to have that exposed to us again. The law was to do that, to show what was not in harmony with God. But the law itself is limited. And so Paul is very careful in his writings to not simply preach a religiosity Judaism. That's not what Paul preaches. 
over and over. That's not what the apostles preach. As much as most of them were very Jewish. And we see historically that they continued with a lot of those practices along the way. But what they were preaching is there is a real God who has loved you from the beginning. And you have the opportunity to come back to see him clearly through what he has done, what he has said, and to come into right relationship with him and begin to live that out through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. I put it this way based on verse 14. Sin is more than just a set of actions. It's a heart condition that manifests as lifestyle choices. Let me see if I can say that differently. We love, um, maybe that's the wrong way to say it. <laughs> yeah, we love to be judges in our world and our culture. I hope when I say that you immediately go, no I don't. <laughs> I hope that's your internal response and that God has done that work. But if you zoom out the lens and look at our world, at our culture, what we see, and particularly right now, is we want the anonymity and comfortability to say whatever we want about any situation, whoever we want, complain about everything. That's what it looks like from the outside, doesn't it? If you, I don't know how many of you are involved in social media stuff and whatnot, but if you look at that, it, that's... It's being talked about in our culture at every level of, is this whole universal connectivity to each other a good thing? <laughs> is this healthy for us? Is it the best? We all want to defend it because there's some cool things about it, right? We love that we can jump on a, a, a goofy little box that has a camera on it and talk to our grandkids that are four states away or on the other side of the country that, or the other side of the world. That's really cool. It's very helpful. It's very cool that we can get biblical things across closed borders to people who desire it. There's lots of exciting, interesting things. God is a God who called us to be inquisitive, to discover, to question things, to explore. He's given us the, the abilities and the graces and the position to be able to do that. That's, um, we, we share some likeness with God in our ability to reason and understand. There's also some real dangers Aren't there? Sin manifests in very practical ways. It is not just a list of bad things that we should try really hard to avoid, but it is this internal heart condition that is leading to or has symptoms that are seeable because they are contrary to God. They result, they influence our choices of real actions and activities. Um, my son, who's not in the room right now, uh, had an interesting uh, um, <laughs> experience the other day in his world. So. Um, I don't know how many of you in this room this will be for, but maybe the folks at home um, or some of the kids who connect in with us will enjoy this. How many of you have heard of this crazy phenomenon, this video game thing called Minecraft? If you've walked through a store, if you've seen a kid lately, whether you understand it or not, you've probably come involved with that. I'm not speaking for or against Minecraft. I will tell you that my son is a Minecraft freak and absolutely loves the idea and the game of it. He likes building things. He likes researching about it. He likes talking to people about it. If you chat with him and open up the conversation, he will probably sing you songs about it and everything, whatever. 
He was watching a video the other day that was a social experiment using Minecraft in which they created scenarios in which people from all over the place who don't know each other could be invited into this world simulation idea and divided into kind of tribal groups and each little tribal group would um, have to decide their own leader, their own kind of ruler, and would live on their own little island. And they would do this for a certain amount of time. I think they did it for 30 days. And what they discovered after a couple of times of doing this is that the nature of human beings goes with them. And you know what happens <laughs> when you put a bunch of people in a video game scenario and say, here, figure it out. Enjoy this fake world, this utopian world. Do whatever you want to do. You know what they do? They make alliances, they get in fights with each other, and they kill each other off. Wow. Even in the virtual world. There, there was this whole thing talking about the various political entities that arose and the various ideas of, well, I think we should all live together. I think we should be fine with each other. I think we should live separately, all these different things. And eventually somebody convinces enough people to go along with them. What do they do? They wipe out everybody else, right? And take over. This nature of sin is within us. It goes where we go. And it isn't just about did I do enough good things today or did I do bad things? Shoot, in our culture, it's so mixed up right now. Satan has, got, has the world so foggy, so confused, we can't even agree what right and wrong is anymore. We're so amored from the foundations of what truth is. Does it begin in me? Or is it something outside of me, something greater than me? Is it based on the highest vote? How many people we can get together? From a biblical perspective, it doesn't matter how many people you get together to vote. I know this is very un-American of me. You know why? Because if you get a whole bunch of people together to vote, what do you have? A whole bunch of sinful natures trying to decide what's right and wrong. It's a, it's a broken premise on its, on its face, on its onset. Okay, well, I've beat up that one enough. Let's go to our last passage here. Our last passage is actually going to blend between two chapters. I'm going to start with the last few verses of chapter 7, and that will take us into chapter 8 down through verse 11. So picking up with chapter 7, verse 24, and then reading on down. Actually, no, I, I told myself earlier, I'm actually going to back up and start at verse 21, because I, I can't help myself. Paul writes this. I find then the principles, the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind <coughs> and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thank, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind in serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Skip down to chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending, <coughs> excuse me, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh 
and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who are, who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you through the body, um, sorry, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised uh, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I would love to just keep reading there and go on and on, but um, we'll stop there for our time today. Um, I love our heading here. All can be rescued from sin and death in Christ. Paul in chapter 7, um, fairly, fairly famously, fairly well-knownly, in, at least in church settings, um, Paul in chapter 7 walks through and describes this common experience of those who have become aware of Christ, have, <laughs> have turned, um, have chosen to seek after Christ. This experience of, I know what's right. I know what God desires of me. I know the offer that he has extended, and I want it. I want to do the right thing. In Paul's case, talking from a, from a good Jewish perspective, he says, I know, I know the law. Now, he is talking about the Old Testament law, but he's talking about that plus. Okay? He's talking about it in connection to God himself. The law of God is what he's referring to. So he's not limiting to only what you would find back in Exodus or Numbers or something like that. He is, he is talking about the nature, all of what God has spoken to us. His law, his standard, his relationship with us. He says, I, I see the principle of, of the law and I, I want it. it. It's beautiful to me. It's good. I have, I have come to accept the truth of who God is, that his way is right. But then all too quickly, I see the principle, this law of sin still within me, rearing up. So how does he describe himself? There in whatever it is, verse 24. Oh, what a wretched man I am. When he sees himself, the inner struggle, the inner darkness, in light of, or in the shadow of who God is, he takes a look and he says, this can't be. This can't continue this way. It's not sustainable. This isn't right. This is, this is wrong of me. This is hypocritical. This is, this is not who I want to be. Stuck here, broken, defenseless, knowing the truth, wanting to follow it, and yet stuck in my own bad behavior, subject, oppressed, held captive to sin itself. 
all too often we stop there in chapter 7. And we find a kindred spirit of, hey, I've felt that before. I know what that feels like. I understand that. And then we go off and we write our own theology that says, hey, Paul experienced this too. This is just what life is like for the rest of our lives. We're just going to struggle with. We've got this internal spirit that wants to do evil things. And yes, God has shown us what to do. So the best we can do is try really, really hard. And, and hopefully God will forgive us at the end or it will all work out. I just took a whole bunch of theology and crammed it all together. Sorry. But that's not where it ends, is it? I love verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. How did he go from, oh, what a wretched man I am, to a verse later saying, thanks be to God. Because now his focus changes, not merely from the condition that he's experienced, but now his eyes get redirected back to who his faith is in. He says, let's take a look at Christ again and what he has done. <laughs> um, so then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Therefore, there's, no, there's now no condemnation, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. He's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. you've got the story mixed up. We need to start by looking at what Christ has done. Did Christ die simply so that I can work harder in my flesh to be better? No, that's not the claim. That's not the promise. No, he has done something radically through his death and resurrection that is changing the whole script of history that now, in submission to Christ, there can be actual victory. He goes on to describe that a bit. <laughs> and he is talking about now, not the nature of the law of God versus the law of sin, but now new language has come in. New language that has come in because of Christ, right? And now he's talking about a whole different type of relationship. And he's talking about the law of the Spirit of God. And where is the Spirit of God described as dwelling? Within. This is a whole new thing. Saying, okay, now through Christ we see that the Spirit has been offered, that I'm no longer subject. That means I don't have to obey sin. It is not compelling in such a way that I am stuck with no way out. Right? We could reference over to, uh, boy, my youth group days are getting rusty now, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Right? But no temptation has seized us except that which is common to man, and he is faithful. And when we are tempted, he is faithful to provide a way out from under it, right? An escape route. We believe that this is universally true. Do we experience temptation? Oh boy, yes, we still do. In fact, I would even warn for someone who's not a believer yet. Hold on to your bootstraps, because sometimes once we become a believer, the temptation from without actually increases and bombards even harder, especially for new believers, that the evil one is going, no, 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 I'm not okay with this arrangement, this change of things. That's kind of a crude way of describing it. But um, 
No. <laughs> uh, we still experience temptation, but we understand that through this relationship with Christ, as we press towards, as we grab hold, as we move toward him and hold on to him, we have a freedom that we're not stuck as addicts to our old flesh. We can say no. We can walk away. We have a new freedom in Christ to actually live a different way. Now, personally, in my experience, I've chosen to describe it this way. So this isn't found in chapter and verse in Scripture. It seems to me in my life that it functions a lot like a muscle. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not much of a workout buff. It's never been a big part of my life. I never really enjoyed a lot of sports and those kinds of things. I didn't do those kinds of things. I am not a big discipline guy in that sense. I should be. I feel shamed about that sometimes. But that's not a big, been a big part of my life. Maybe some of you have some more expertise there. You were the, the jocks in school or you got to, you, you, maybe you went the military path or something and you've experienced that sense of real personal discipline in a practical way. I think that our new lives in Christ function a lot like someone in training where they're exercising new muscles that haven't been worked much. And this faith muscle needs to be practiced with. My kids don't like this. My kids will complain, oh, my, my legs hurt and whatever. I'm like, you've been walking 10 minutes. Come on, you know. Because they're just not used to it. They, your body needs to be pushed, right? We have to feel the strain, the discomfort of exercise, of things that are good for us. The bad taste of good for you food rather than the delightful taste of junk food, right? All these kinds of things. There is a strain to it. There is a new experience. It is a challenge to us. But when we overcome the old habits and the old desires, when we say no to that because of the freedom that we now have, and we experience the benefit, the joy, the overcoming of, through faith, our faith grows. It strengthens. It becomes easier to say yes next time. It becomes easier the time after that. And even when we do stumble and we, we turn back to the old thinking for a moment, the old way, that doesn't mean that somehow all of a sudden that new muscle just totally deflates and goes away, right? No, we're able to repent we're able to turn back to the Lord and continue to grow, continue to strengthen. Amen? That's how I've experienced it in my life. I'm interested in your stories as well. Paul points to this, that now everything has changed because of the Spirit being given, the indwelling presence of God within us ministering, walking with our spirits, developing a relationship. We know that part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to be, to be molding, to be um, meddling in our lives, to be bringing a for, a, about what is called the, the fruit of the Spirit or the characteristics that are like Christ. Okay, Christ sets us free from sin and death so that we might become righteous through his spirit. That's the goal that he's aiming at. Um, I'm, running, I'm run out of time, so I can't describe all that I had hoped to there in the idea of righteousness. Um, th those are fighting words in some theological circles. It's right there in scripture for us. Um, we need to be careful that we're not saying that I'm 
achieving my salvation through good things that I do. That's not what we're talking about, right? We're not talking about earning something for ourselves through righteousness. But scripture makes it very clear that there is a transformation of life, that now there is real freedom and real difference in who we are, that we can now live righteously. We can live in a way that is in harmony with Christ, that he gives us real victory. Finally, the law is fulfilled by loving God wholly. Um, I put up the Mark verse. I would refer back to, remember what Mark uh, 1230 tells us? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. The law is fulfilled. Christ himself said that, that if we would do these things, that this summarizes, that this fulfills the whole of the law and the prophets. He himself said, all of what this law of God is about, it's about loving him with your whole being. That's the end goal. That's the mission of who we are to be. The mission outwardly is to call others into that relationship. The God of the universe wants to be in a completely holistic relationship with you where you know and love him with your whole being and you receive all of the love of God that he has for you. So I put it that way at the the end here. All of him for all of you. The rescue that God extends is more than just a getting out of trouble because you did something wrong. That's included in the package, and I'm so glad that it is. And oftentimes when we're entering into initial relationship with the Lord, that's often where our focus is at the time. I feel very guilty about this way I've been living, these choices, the way I treated these people. God, if there's any way, can you forgive me for the type of person I have become? Would you do something new with me? Right? That's often where we're at when we're entering into our initial relationship with Jesus. But please understand that his deep heart desire for you doesn't stop there. God desires that you would have all of him. What I mean by that is not that somehow somehow God comes and he, and he only, only gives you a little bit of himself and then if you do something better or if you believe him a little more, then he gives you a little. That's not what I'm trying to imply. What I'm implying, what I'm trying to say is, he is offering him his whole self to you. Nothing held back. And what he desires, the exchange, the relationship that he's desiring to come into, is one that is so full, so free, that the natural exchange is we offer all of ourselves. Because we totally trust him. And he is able to saturate and fill us and offer us all of himself in exchange. I hope that's a useful, meaningful way to explain it this morning. We are in need of rescue. We have seen as we walk through the scripture that... um, Sin has run amok and caused all kinds of problems. It's not going to go away from the story, but we are working closer and closer to seeing this great change that Jesus brings to now we're not just dealing with this battle of sin within all the time, um, but we can enter into a new relationship with God that is based on the Spirit of God within, giving us real victory. Well, I need to wrap up there. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word this morning. 
Uh, it's a challenge to us. One, we don't often talk this way very much anymore. Um, these are challenging areas of scripture. At the same time, we sure identify. We know what the nature of sin is. We've all experienced it. We can see it in ourselves when we're quiet and still and honest. We know what it feels like. Lord, we've, we've all known those moments when we're tender with you. And we feel this pull. We have this desire to receive the abundant life that you've called us to. We have a desire to, be, to not fight with you and war against you. We have a desire to be with you eternally and to walk into heaven. Yet at the same time, we, we experience this pull of selfishness, of perhaps anger for some of us, unforgiveness towards past wounds, um, pride in some area, and God, some of those really have deep clutches, and we bear the claw marks of that sin holding on to our lives. Lord, may we fully embrace with our minds and our hearts and our spirits that we are no longer subject to sin. We don't have to continue down that path and give it the deciding vote in our lives. But rather, because of your great work on the cross, we can trust you and receive your spirit into our lives and walk in faith, trusting that each time temptation comes up, each time you expose that we are our, our mind that we're thinking about um, self-centered things, that we're being neglectful of you and not putting you first, that we can repent of that and say yes to you, that you, we can look to your word as our guide, that we can pray to you, that we can depend on our spirit, and in those moments, you can give us, through your spirit, strength to experience real victory and overcome sin. Lord, that's not about us. That's not about how great we are, how powerful we are. That is simply that you are such a loving God and you have thoroughly come to our aid, come to our rescue as our deliverer. God, may we embrace it for all that you have to offer instead of um, cheapening or, or um, only receiving the small tip of the iceberg of your great power and love. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May you guide us through this week. May you use us as a loving, gracious testimony to others as well. May there be no room for pride or arrogance in our lives. In your name, amen. You are loved by a holy God, and I encourage you this week to have your mind and your eyes fixed on him, that you would fully embrace that he has already defeated sin. When you experience temptation this week, you do not have to give in to it. Flee from it and cling to him. He has already provided the victory. You're dismissed.